This is the second video lecture for section 2.5 on miscellaneous voting methods. In this lecture, I'll be talking about runoff voting. So a runoff election is an election that occurs after an initial election when a clear winner has not been decided. Often this can be that no candidate received a majority of the votes or no candidate cleared a certain threshold of a percentage of the votes. So what they do is they have a new election, but some of the candidates who didn't get many votes are eliminated. And in the US, several states actually require a candidate to receive a majority in primary elections. So the primary elections that happen, we talked about these several lectures ago, the primary elections for selecting presidential candidates, uh, these states require a candidate to get a majority. And if no candidate does, a runoff occurs. So there's really two types of runoffs. There's this second election runoff that we were just talking about, where we have a new election on a different date, and only the top, usually two, but it can be a different number, uh, those top candidates remain on the ballot. But there's another type of runoff that we're going to be talking about today, and that's an instant runoff, where we use voter preference lists to eliminate candidates who received low amounts of votes, and then we recalculate the winner. So we don't take those votes and throw them away. We say, okay, well, who was this person's second choice or third choice, and use that to figure out who they would have voted for in a new election. So the new election isn't needed because we recorded every voter's full preference. Now, this is pretty rare in the US because most states do not use preference lists for elections. But if we have those preference lists, we can do this. Let's just talk a little bit more about those second election runoffs, though. When we have those runoff elections, the turnout is usually much lower. There's reduced interest in the runoff election because it's usually the only election that's happening that day. You can imagine that in a general election, you're voting not only maybe for president, but you're also voting for senator, state representatives, local representatives, and so on versus a runoff election where usually that's just the one race that you're voting for. So often that winner of that runoff election is called into question because it's not the same group of voters and you're always wondering, well, would that person have won on the original date? So instant runoffs are meant to try to solve that problem. So when one candidate doesn't receive a majority of the votes, the idea of instant runoff is that we eliminate candidates until someone does get a majority. And there's two ways to do this, and we're gonna talk about both of these today. So there's two ways to eliminate candidates. One method is contingent voting, where we eliminate all but the top two vote getters and then determine the winner between those two. And then there's also instant runoff voting. So un unfortunately, a little confusion with the name here. So instant runoffs are a big category of election methods, but then the instant runoff voting method is one specific method. So unfortunately, that can get a little confusing. And as we'll see a little bit later in that instant runoff method, what we do is we eliminate candidates one at a time rather than all at once until we have one candidate that receives a majority. Okay, so here's the details for that first method called contingent voting. So we start by having voters rank all candidates in a preference order. We're used to that. We're gonna be seeing voter profiles like we've been seeing the last several lectures. And if one candidate wins a majority of the first place votes, we're done. We don't have to eliminate anybody. We just declare that candidate the winner. But if at the beginning we don't have any candidate that has a majority of first place votes, we eliminate all candidates except the two who got the most first place votes. So we throw everybody out except for those top two. And then the winner of the election is the winner of that pairwise matchup. And we've talked a lot about those between those two candidates. OK, so let's see this in action. So here we have a voter profile. We have four candidates and we want to find the winner using the contingent method. So what we do is we count up how many first place votes did each candidate get? So how many did A get? So what we're looking for are voters who have A ranked at the top. So we've got one category of voters there. There are four of them. So A would get four first place votes. How many first place votes would B get? Well, we've got six voters who have B as their top choice. So B would get six. We've got two different groups of voters who like C the best. Eight voters up at the top and two down at the bottom. Eight plus two is 10. So that's 10 voters for C. And then D has three people who like them the best, so D gets three votes. So now C has the most votes, so C would be the plurality winner, but do they have a majority? So what we need to do to figure out if we have a majority is we need to add up all these numbers. 8 plus 6 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 is 23. So a majority would be half of that total. So majority would be more than half of that number, more than... 23 divided by 2, which is 11.5. So to be a majority, you would have to have 12 or more votes to win. Now C, even though they have the most votes, only has 10 votes, and that's not more than 11.5, so C doesn't have a majority. So what we do is we eliminate 
everybody but the top two. So C is on top, C has the most first place votes, and B with six has the second most first place votes. So that means we eliminate A and D. And now the winner of this election is going to be the winner of the pairwise matchup of the two remaining candidates, B versus C. And we've done those a lot before. So let's just go through and count it. We've got eight voters here. They like C the best, so those votes go to C. Six voters here like B the best, so those go to B. These four voters, well, they can't vote for A, so instead they vote for their second choice, which is C. The next row, three voters, they can't vote for D, they can't vote for A, so they end up having to vote for their third choice, which is B, so three votes there. And then finally, two voters at the bottom, they like C the best, so they vote for C. We add up these totals, B gets nine votes, C gets 14 votes, and so C ends up being the winner. So that's how we work through this with contingent voting. Okay, let's do one more example. This one, the number's a little bit bigger, but we've only got three candidates, but we're gonna work through it the same way. So our first step in using the contingent voting method is to count up the first place votes that each candidate receives. And again, what we're doing is we're looking at the preference orders and looking at the first choices of each of these voters. That's what we mean, that's what we mean by first place votes. So 37 voters at the top, they like A the best, so they would cast their vote for A. 35 voters in the second row of my table, they like B the best, so that, those votes go to B. And then in the third row of my table, 28 voters, they like C the best. So the biggest number there is A. A has the most first place votes. But if I add these numbers up, 37 plus 35 plus 28 is 100. And so a majority would be more than half of 100, which is 50. And A has the most first place votes, but A doesn't have 51 votes, so A would not be the winner yet. So now what we do is we eliminate all candidates except for the two that got the top numbers of votes. So in this case, A had the most, B had the second most, so C would get eliminated. So again, with contingent voting, if nobody has a majority at the beginning, you eliminate everybody except the top two first place vote getters. And then you figure out the winner of the one-on-one -on -one matchup between those two voters, which in this case is A versus B. So the 37 voters in the first row of my table, they like A the best, so they'll vote for A. 35 voters in the second row of my table, they like B the best, so they'll vote for B. And then the 28 voters, they can't vote for C because C got eliminated, so instead they vote for A. And so if I add this up, A gets 65, B gets 35, so A is going to be the contingent voting method winner. So we determined that A was the winner of this election, but let's suppose that some time goes by and now there's another election with the same candidates. And maybe people have changed their minds a little bit. So some of the people who had B rank first, some of these voters, have decided that, you know what, that A character, they're, they're pretty good. So we like A a little bit better than we did before. So specifically, let's suppose that we have 10 voters who initially had this preference B first, C second, A third, and they've changed their minds and they've moved A up to the front. So again, watch what's happening here. So our original preference was B greater than C greater than A. And now what's happening is they decided, you know what, we still feel the same way about B versus C, but now we want A to be up in the front. We want A better than B better than C. So what that means is that we've got 10 voters who moved from this category up to this category. So what's that gonna do to these numbers? Well, instead of 37 voters in that first row of my table, I'm gonna have 47 voters up there. And instead of 35 voters in the second row of my table, that's down to 25, because 10 of those voters shifted their preferences to match A, B, C. Okay, so which candidate is the contingency winner now? Well, we're gonna do it the same way. We're gonna look at first place votes. So A now has 47 first place votes, B only has 25 first place votes, and C has, still has 28 first place votes. So A still has the most first place votes, but still not quite a majority, right? So 47 is not more than 50, so A does not have a majority. And now, instead of eliminating C, now C is in second place, so we eliminate B. And so now the matchup to figure out the overall winner is A versus C. So the voters in the first row of my table, they like uh, A the best, so there's 47 there. The second row of my table, if it's A versus C, they can't vote for B, so instead they vote for C, so that's 25 votes there. And the 28 voters in the third row of my table, well, they like C the best, so they vote for C. And now look what happened. C ends up winning this matchup, so C has now become the contingency winner. 
And this should seem a little strange to you. Like, what the heck happened? We moved A higher on some of these ballots. That's the only thing that changed, right? 10 voters decided we like A better than we thought. We move A to the top of our ballots. And by making that change, they caused A to lose the election. That seems really, really strange. That seems unfair. And what it shows is that contingent voting is not monotone. Now, you may recognize that word monotone because we've talked about it before. We talked about monotone when we discussed two candidate elections. And with two candidates, what monotone meant is that if we had a new election and the only thing we changed was that some voters changed their vote from a vote for the original loser to a vote for the original winner, then the new election should have the same outcome. So the idea of monotone with more than two candidates is basically the same. It says, look, if the only thing you change is that you have a new election and some voters decide that the original winner of the original election, that they like them better, they move them higher up on their ballots, but don't change anything else, right? The only thing that changes is that the original winner is ranked higher, but the order of the other candidates isn't changed, then the new election should have the same outcome, right? So if you decide that the candidate who won before People like them even better than they did before. Well, they shouldn't now lose, but that's exactly what happened in that example too that we worked through. Okay, now let's talk about the second method of runoff voting that we talked about earlier. So in this method, instant runoff voting, we do very close to the same thing, but instead of eliminating a whole bunch of candidates all at once, we're gonna eliminate candidates one at a time. So again, we start with voters ranking their candidates in a preference order. And if one candidate has a majority of first place votes, then we stop and that candidate is the winner. But if not, then we're going to eliminate the candidate that received the least amount of first place votes. So we're only going to eliminate one candidate, the candidate at the bottom. And then we're going to recalculate our preferences to see if any candidate now has a majority of first place votes. So we may find that a candidate gets a majority without having to go through the process of eliminating everybody. But if not, then we keep repeating, continuing to eliminate one candidate at a time, the candidate with the lowest amount of first place votes, until one candidate has a majority and that candidate is the winner. Okay, so let's work through an example. So we're going to start off the same way. We're going to start by counting up the number of first place votes that each candidate has. So we've got A, B, C, and D here. So this first row of my table shows me that A has four first place votes. The second row shows me that C has three first place votes. B also has three first place votes, and D only has two. So A is in the lead. A has the most first place votes, but is that a majority? So remember, we always have to, we're going to keep going until we have somebody have a majority. So we need to figure out what that means. So we add up these numbers, 4 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2 is 12. And so a majority is more than half of that. So a majority is more than 12 divided by 2, which is 6. So we would have to have somebody with seven or more first place votes in order to have anybody with a majority. And we don't have that right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the lowest number of first place votes, which is D here, and we're going to eliminate D. But we're not going to take those two voters and throw them away. We're going to take those voters and look at their preference and figure out who do those voters vote for now. So in other words, we're going through our profile. And we're just getting rid of D, but we're not getting rid of any voters. We're just getting rid of a candidate. So now we're going to recalculate how many first place votes do we have. So now we only have A, B, and C as our candidates. So who do these 12 voters vote for now? Well, these four voters in the first row of my table, they still like A the best, so they're still going to vote for A. These three voters still like C the best. These three voters still like B the best. Now, who do these two voters vote for? They can't vote for D anymore because D is gone. So their second choice is B. So those two voters vote for B. So B ends up having five first place votes. So B is now in the lead and having the most first place votes, but they still don't have a majority. You'd have to have seven or more votes to have a majority. B doesn't have that many. So we're gonna take the number of the, the candidate with the least number of first place votes, and we're gonna eliminate them. And right now that's C. Three is the lowest number between three, four, and five. So we eliminate that candidate. So again, we're going through our profile and just crossing out all the Cs. And so now we just have two candidates remaining, A and B. And again, we're just counting up the number of first place votes. A still has four votes from the top row of my table. What about the second row of my table? Well, they like C the best, but they can't vote for C. They like D second best, but D has gone. So instead they vote for B. The third row of my table, they like B the best, so they vote for B. And the fourth row of my table, they like B second best. And so they end up voting for B as well. B ends up with eight votes, 
Finally, we have a candidate with a majority, and so B is the instant runoff winner. So just one note about ties. So if there's a tie for who to eliminate when you're using the contingent or instant runoff method, you're going to eliminate all of the tied candidates. So even though instant runoff, for example, says to only eliminate one candidate at a time, there might be a tie for who has the fewest first place votes, and so you would eliminate all of those people who are tied. The only time you wouldn't do that is if doing that would eliminate all of the candidates and you would have nobody left over. In that case, the outcome of the election would be a tie. So that is possible, but again, even though the examples that we typically work on have relatively small numbers, in the real world, if we were going to use one of these methods, we're going to have hundreds, thousands, or even millions of voters, and so an exact tie is extremely unlikely. So we don't worry about ties too much, but they can happen in some of these examples that we're looking at. Okay, so here's a summary. I'm not going to go through absolutely everything in this list here, but here's a summary of all the different voting methods that we've talked about. So we've talked about five sort of large uh, categories of voting methods. And what we found is that each of these voting methods has some kind of problem, suffers from some kind of flaw, or has some kind of fairness criteria that it does not meet. So where do we go from here? We could continue our search and try to find a fair, perfect voting system that doesn't have any of these problems. But we could also consider trying to use a different kind of ballot, right? Everything that we've done so far has been focused on preference list ballots, but maybe there are other kinds of ballots out there. So those are ideas that we're going to explore in the next section. I'll see you then.